Welcome to part three of this intro to synthesis series. I'm going to assume that if you've gotten this far, you're already familiar with the three elements of sound, the five most common waveforms, and the seven main components of a synthesizer. Also, I suspect by now that you've been sufficiently exposed to the messages that we've been subliminally bombarding you with during the first two tapes in this series, all part of a carefully orchestrated conspiracy of computer wisnoids whose secret hidden agenda involves global domination through the use of select audio frequency modulation. But let's not worry about any of that for the time being. Instead, what I'd like to do is explore a little further all of the principles that we've talked about in the first two tapes. We'll do that by making some sounds from scratch, as well as by modifying existing sounds, in order to see how the seven main components actually work. We'll also try and talk about some of the miscellaneous features and components, aside from the big seven, that you're likely to run into on some synthesizers, but not others. Things like noise, sync, cross-modulation, etc. And finally, we'll spend a little time discussing performance controls. Those are controllers, like the pitch bend wheel or the mod wheel. And it even includes such features as velocity, sensitivity, and aftertouch. So, let's continue our discussion of sound modifying parameters by talking about noise. Early synthesizers had a separate oscillator that generated random noise. That is, random frequencies that created the sound of shh or a wave or the winds that are associated with transient attacks on percussive instruments. Let me say that another way. <laughs> noise sounds like this. Or this. Today's newer hybrids, which consist of PCM samples or wave tables of different sounds, offer a separate sampled waveform of different kinds of noise that can be incorporated into your sound. Noise is used to create the breathy quality at the beginning of a flute sound or to impart some distortion to electric guitar. Here is a noise sample on the Roland D50. This is the noise switch on a Casio CZ. Here's the sound without noise. Here's the sound with. As always, noise is a useful component for adding a breathy quality to a sound or creating transient attacks, as in snare drums or percussion sounds. This is the feedback parameter on the DX7. It's the DX7's equivalent of being able to introduce noise into a sound. If we increase the feedback level from 0 to 7, hear what happens to the sound. When making sounds using the seven main components, there's sometimes the temptation to utilize everything but the kitchen sink. In fact, sometimes we even use the sink. Let's talk about sync. Sync is a parameter in which one oscillator controls the frequency of another oscillator. So that every time the first oscillator completes its first cycle and begins another cycle, it forces the second oscillator to begin its cycle as well, regardless of whether it's completed its cycle. The result is the second oscillator continually abbreviates the cycle of its waveform. The effect of this in the sound is that as you change the frequency of the oscillator being synced, you change not the pitch of the overall sound, but the harmonic content. For example, let's turn on the sync parameter and then change the frequency of oscillator 2 to hear how that affects the timbre in the sound. Even though I'm changing the pitch of oscillator 2, because it is being synced by oscillator 1, the overall sound has a change in timbre. 
what sync is doing is forcing oscillator 2 to sync up to oscillator 1. Just as resonance is more obvious when the filter cutoff point changes over time, the effect of sync becomes more obvious when the frequency of the oscillator being synced changes over time. Let's do that by controlling the frequency of oscillator 2 by one of the envelope generators. Here's oscillator 2. Now let's assign envelope number 1 to control it. We then select envelope number 1 and change its parameter to hear the effect changing the frequency of oscillator 1 has when sync is being engaged. Let's raise the level a little and slow down the rate that goes to that level and hear what happens to the sound. Just as the exaggerated harmonics at the filter cutoff point of resonance can be heard as the filter cutoff point changes over time, the exaggerated harmonic in the sync mode can be heard as the frequency of the oscillator being synced changes over time. Amplitude modulation is similar to frequency modulation, or what's sometimes called cross-modulation, in which one oscillator is used to modulate another oscillator. Let's see what happens as I engage amplitude modulation, turning it on, and then change the octave range of one of the oscillators. This process is similar to FM in that it generates a variety of sidebands, making the waveform rich in harmonics. This is the glide parameter, also referred to as portamento, and in a variation as glissando. And it controls the speed with which an oscillator moves from one note to another. With glide at a setting of zero, the oscillator moves instantly from note to note. If we slow down the rate of glide, the oscillator takes longer to get from note to note. This is the portamento parameter on the D50, and by setting the rate of the portamento and engaging the portamento button, we can turn this sound into this sound. These three parameters control the portamento the kinds of portamento, as well as the rate of portamento. The DX7 allows you to have a continuous portamento, or with the glissando parameter on, the portamento will be by step. This parameter allows you to set the time value for portamento. I just want to say something about performance, and it's this. How you perform a sound, in other words, the way you play it, has almost as much to do with making the sound convincing as does the sound itself. In other words, I might have this great electric guitar sound, but if I play it as if it were a honky-tonk piano, 
it wouldn't be convincing. However, if I play it while trying to retain some of the performance characteristics of the sound, it makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> So let's look at some performance controls. This is the pitch bend wheel. It allows me to control the overall pitch of the sound in real time. That is, as I play the note. Being able to alter some aspect of a sound in real time is an important way of imparting life to a synthesized sound. It makes your performance more, well, for lack of a better word, human. It's the kind of thing that can help make your synthesizer more of an instrument. Let's look at some of these performance controls or controllers and see how they interact with the various synthesizer components we've already discussed. This first one, the pitch bend wheel, is obviously controlling the frequency of the oscillator. Remember, the oscillator controls pitch. Well, the only difference between this pitch bend wheel and the tuning control inside the synthesizer is that the tuning control is inside the synthesizer, and the pitch bend wheel is sitting in a handy location right near the keyboard. They both are doing the same exact thing. They control pitch. Most synthesizers today offer variable pitch bend. In other words, they let you determine the range of the pitch bend, anywhere from a minor second, a half step, to an octave. This parameter allows you to adjust the range of pitch bend on the DX7, up to an octave. The DX7 also allows you to enter a value for the step of the pitch bend. Next, let's take a look at the mod wheel. The mod wheel is similar to the pitch bend wheel, except instead of controlling the frequency of the oscillator, the mod wheel will normally control the amount of LFO. Let's talk about this a little. When we first looked at the LFO, we saw how once you set the assorted values for which waveform would do the modulating and what the rate of LFO would be, you could then adjust the depth or the amount of the LFO effect that would be in the sound. Well, there's another way of adding LFO to a sound. Instead of programming the LFO amount so that it's a permanent part of the sound from beginning to end, the mod wheel lets us introduce LFO into the sound whenever we want. The further we move the wheel, the more LFO we hear. You see, the mod wheel is exactly the same as the LFO amount parameter. The only difference is that it's sitting in a handy location to the left of the keyboard for easy instant access. It lets you introduce and change the amount of LFO in a sound in real time. Some synths allow you to route the mod wheel so that it controls other parameters of the sound, such as the filter or the amplifier. But the principle is still the same. It allows you to control the amount of something in real time, whether it's the amount of LFO vibrato or the amount of brightness. Different synths have different versions of performance controls. The Korg M1 has a joystick instead of a pitch wheel and a separate mod wheel. The joystick does the job of the pitch wheel and the mod wheel by assigning both functions to different points on an XY axis. Pitch bend goes left to right. Pitch modulation goes up. and filter modulation goes down. Let's see what happens when we change the amount of pitch bend. Right now, it's a whole step, or two semitones. Here's a three-way pitch bend mod wheel controller, typical of Roland instruments, which allows you to control pitch bend left to right, as well as modulation, pressing it forward. The point is, they all function in basically the same way. They let you reach inside your sound and change some aspect of it in real time. 
Two other useful kinds of performance controls are velocity sensitivity and aftertouch. They may not seem like performance controls because they're built right into your keyboard, but they are. Just like the mod wheel and the pitch bend wheel, they let you control some aspect of a sound in real time according to how you play the keys. The first one, velocity sensitivity, generally lets you control the volume of a sound according to how quickly you strike the key. On some synths, velocity sensitivity can control other parameters, such as the speed of the attack or the amount of brightness. Let's take a look at velocity sensitivity on the Korg M1. This page has to do with velocity sensitivity and its control of the amplifier and the volume envelope parameters. We can control overall amplitude, the overall speed of the volume envelope, the attack rate, the decay rate, the slope rate, and the release rate. Let's hear what happens when we control the overall amplitude of a sound using velocity sensitivity. This is its most common application. When this value is at zero, how I play has no effect on the volume or amplitude of the sound. Quickly or slowly. The level or amplitude of the sound remains the same. If, however, I increase the value of amplitude sensitivity, how I play the note will determine the level of the note. If I play it quickly, the level will be louder than if I play it softly. Velocity sensitivity control of the amplitude. This page allows us to set velocity sensitivity according to different parts of the filter and filter envelope. We can set it for the envelope intensity, or the amount. We can set it for the envelope time, which will control the rate of the envelope according to how quickly or slowly you play. We can set it for the speed of attack, for the decay, and for the slope time, as well as the release time. Let's hear what happens if we set the velocity sensitivity to control the intensity of the envelope generator. When the value for this parameter is set at zero, it doesn't matter whether I play quickly or slowly. The envelope amount for the filter is still the same. However, if I set the value at 99, how I play the note will change the amount of the filter envelope. In the Insonic SQ-80, the parameter LV in the envelope section stands for velocity control of the level, level velocity. When this parameter is engaged, how you strike the key will determine the level of whatever parameter the envelope is controlling. So for example, if we set this parameter in envelope 4, which on this instrument always controls the overall amplitude, then Striking the key will control the total volume amount, the overall amplitude level. If I strike the key slowly, the note is soft. If I strike the key quickly, the note is loud. Velocity control of the amplitude. If this envelope generator were affecting the filter, instead of loudness, I would be controlling brightness. If this envelope were controlling pitch, instead of loudness or brightness, I would be controlling pitch. This parameter, TIV, or time number one velocity, controls the attack rate of the sound according to whatever parameter the envelope is controlling. In this case, because envelope 4 is controlling the overall volume level, this velocity sensitivity will determine the speed of the attack of the volume envelope. So for example, by engaging 
velocity sensitivity of the attack. If I play quickly, the attack will be quick. If I play slowly, the attack will be slow. Aftertouch is another keyboard feature that lets you change parts of a sound as you're playing the note. Aftertouch is engaged after you've already struck the note by pressing the key even further down into the bed of the keyboard. It's commonly used to control vibrato, in other words, the amount of the LFO, or sometimes even pitch bend. This is the aftertouch page on the Korg M1. It allows us to control parameters like the pitch bend, the amount of LFO to the pitch, or the pitch modulation generator, the VDF cutoff point, that's the filter, the VDF modulation generator, that's LFO control of the filter, and the volume envelope amplitude. Let's see what happens when we control pitch bend using aftertouch. Let's hear what happens when we control the amount of the LFO controlling the pitch from aftertouch. As I raise the value, I can impart LFO to the pitch or oscillator by pressing down into the keyboard. This parameter enables us to control volume, or the level of the amplitude, according to aftertouch. The Core Game 1 also provides the ability to control that parameter in a negative range. So, for example, if we were controlling it with a negative value, its effect would be this. To decrease the volume instead of increase the volume. Aftertouch, control of the amplitude. Let's take a look at how the Roland D50 allows you to control pitch bend using aftertouch. At the moment, it's set to two semitones. By pressing the key further into the bed of the keyboard, we can bend the pitch. This parameter is also adjustable up or down, an octave. There's a third keyboard control, which is called release velocity. Whereas velocity sensitivity affects sound according to how quickly you strike the key, release velocity affects sound according to how quickly you release the key. It generally controls the rate of the release portion of the volume envelope. Not too many synths have it though, so forget I said it. The sustain pedal is a kind of performance controller. When you step on it, it has the effect of slowing down the release rate of the volume envelope. The volume pedal is another performance controller. In many ways, it's identical to the modulation wheel in that it allows you to control the amount of something in real time. But just because it's called a volume pedal, don't let that make you think it can only control the volume. Depending on what optional routings your synthesizer might have, it could also control the amount of the LFO or the amount of brightness. Anyway, all of these different controllers do approximately the same thing. They let you change the sound in real time while you're playing. And they do that by affecting one of the seven main components. Hmm.
seven main components. That sounds familiar. Yes, those very same seven main components that I've been trying to hammer into your thick heads for the past three hours. Don't be insulted, I'm just kidding. Not about the seven main components, but about your having thick heads. Actually, if you've already gotten this far, you're doing pretty well. Or you fell asleep and left the VCR running. There's one other general feature that you're likely to find on most synthesizers today, and although I just as soon avoid the topic altogether, we really ought to talk about it. My reluctance to explain this feature is based on the fact that not only does every manufacturer under the sun call it by a different name, but each of them implements it in a different way. Anyway, aside from all that, it's really pretty simple to understand. Keyboard tracking allows you to affect part of a sound according to where you are playing on the keyboard. Here's a common situation. Say you design a great sounding synthesizer patch, but when you start to play it, you realize that although it sounds terrific in the middle two octaves, as you get higher and higher up the keyboard, it becomes much too bright. So bright that it's unusable. The high part might have exactly the same relative amount of filtering, but in that high range, it's still too bright. This is a job for keyboard tracking. In this instance, keyboard tracking, or key scaling, or key follow, allows you to alter the amount of filtering or brightness in a sound according to where you play on the keyboard. In effect, it allows you to make the high notes a little less bright so that the entire keyboard is playable. The higher you play, the lower the filter. In addition to affecting the relative filter amounts, keyboard tracking, or keyboard scaling, or key follow, can also be used to affect relative volume so that the higher you play, the quieter the note becomes. And it can also affect the relative envelope rate. In other words, it can determine how long a note is depending on where it is played on the keyboard. Here's an example. Let's hear what happens when we use keyboard scaling to control the decay of the volume envelope. Here's what this mallet sound sounds like without keyboard scaling. The length of the volume envelope is consistent across the keyboard. The volume envelope for this high C is the same length as the volume envelope for this low C. By engaging keyboard scaling, we tailor the keyboard so that the higher we get, the shorter the envelope. This effect mimics what occurs naturally on many acoustic instruments, which is that the higher you play on the keyboard or the instrument, the shorter the note becomes. Without, the length of all the notes are the same. With, the length of the notes shortens as we ascend the keyboard. All righty. So let's finally put all this stuff together and try to make some sounds. Let me give you an example of how to employ sync to make an electric guitar sound on this ancient analog synthesizer. Don't worry if you can't follow all the steps. Just try and keep the basic concepts in mind. We'll start out by controlling the pitch of one of the oscillators. We do that by assigning the filter envelope to control oscillator A. That's because this synthesizer doesn't have its own pitch envelope. But the effect is the same. We're designing a pitch envelope to control one of the oscillators. Now what I will do is introduce oscillator B. sync switch on slave oscillator B to oscillator A. Listen to what happens to the two tones, one moving and one static, when they're synced together. As you can see, the effect of oscillator A's pitch bend is that now instead of the pitch changing over time, the timbre is changing slowly over time. That element alone is almost effective enough to be a convincing electric guitar.
With a little fine tuning, we can then turn this sound with its dynamic harmonic movement into an electric guitar. First, I fiddle with the filter. Add a little bit of resonance, change the envelope amount. Reselect some waveforms. Rebalance the oscillators. Adjust the frequency of the LFO so that I can add it using the modulation wheel. In the early days of synthesis on analog synthesizers, you had to design sounds from scratch. That's because your source material was limited to the five most common waveforms. Your triangle wave, your sawtooth wave, your square wave, your pulse wave, and your sine wave. These days, however, the hybrid synths, like your SQ80, your D50, your M1, offer a wide range of sampled waveforms in addition to those five common waveforms. The point is, is that on today's hybrid synths, in many instances, it doesn't make sense to start from scratch because the waveforms available take you half the way there. But it is important, even if you're not making sounds from scratch, to know how to modify existing sounds. And that's an important part of what we're going to discuss here. So let's spend some time modifying existing sounds, changing one sound to another sound to understand how the seven main components work, even on the hybrid sense. All right, let's fool around a little bit with the Korg M1 and see how by applying the principles of synthesis we've discussed, we can change an existing sound into another sound. Here's a brass sound. Let's change it into a cello sound. First, let's change the attack. We'll go to the volume envelope, VDA, EG, and slow down the existing attack from a value of 2 to a value of 49. See how simply by changing that one parameter, the attack of the volume envelope, we were able to turn this brass sound into a string-like sound. Now all I have to do is lower the frequency of the sound to put it closer to the cello range. I do that by going to the oscillator page and where it says octave range, I lower it. See how we've turned a brass sound into a string sound. simply changing two parameters, the attack of the volume envelope and the frequency of the oscillator. Let's turn this pretty sound, sort of an airy string sound, into a funky bass. All right, now I'm going to do this kind of fast, so try and follow what I'm doing. First, I want to go into the volume envelope and shorten the sound so that it's very abrupt with almost no sustain. I'll select envelope 4, which on this Ensonic SQ80 controls the overall volume envelope for all three oscillators. First, I'll turn all the rates or the time values to zero. And now I will lower level 3, which is the sustain level, to 0 as well. There you go. Now you see what used to be a very nice sustained string sound is now a very abrupt little bit blip of an attack. I can increase that little blip of an attack by increasing the value 
for time number three. Because as you see, level two is going to zero level three. The value of T3 determines the time it takes to get there. That's about enough. Now let's go to the oscillator section and change the frequency of all three oscillators. Let's lower the octaves. For oscillator one, and now oscillator two. And now oscillator three. Actually, we want, we could leave one of these higher. We still have a, a good bass sound with two of the three oscillators at a low octave. If we wanted at this point, we could go to the filter and fool around with a little resonance. We'll see what happens when we increase the resonance. Let's see what happens when we change the filter cutoff point. Now, if I wanted to, I could have the LFO control the filter cutoff point. Let's do that real quickly and see what happens to the sound. I'll use LFO number one as a source. You see, by increasing the amount of LFO to the filter modulation, I might also want to slow down the frequency of the LFO. You see how each note has a different kind of filter setting because the LFO is changing it gradually over time. All right, let's compare the sound we have now with the original sound. You can see how drastically a sound can be changed and modified by simply altering the values of a few select parameters. Understanding in advance what effect a parameter will have on a sound is what sound design is about. Remember, all I did to change this sound to this sound was adjust a few parameters. I changed the frequency of the oscillators by dropping the octaves. I changed the volume envelope by removing the sustain. And I altered the filter by modulating it with the LFO. And that's it. Let's try turning this metal harp sound on the D50 into a more sustained pad. First, let's examine what each of the individual oscillators are doing, or the four partials. By muting three of the four partials at a time, we can isolate individual partials to hear what they're made up of. Three of the four oscillators in this sound, or partials as they call them, are dedicated to PCMs, or digital samples. The fourth, lower tone partial number two, is dedicated to an analog waveform. Let's go into partial number two and extend the volume envelope 
of that analog waveform. Remember, we want to turn this abbreviated harp sound into a long sustained pad. I've entered the edit parameters for partial two. I notice two parameters, TVF, which is time variable filter, and TVA, time variable amplifier. This is the filter envelope and the volume envelope. Get accustomed to recognizing those common parameters under different guises. Let's extend the volume envelope. I enter the parameter, and I see a page that gives me times and levels. Let's turn all the levels up to maximum. We put sustain at 100. And just to make sure, level 3 and level 2. Automatically, we hear that the envelope of the analog waveform has been extended so that it sustains. Let's examine the filter envelope and the filter. I access the TVF parameter, and we see a parameter for the filter cutoff frequency. See how by raising the filter, we make it brighter. By lowering it, we make it duller. Let's start out low and use the filter envelope to design a shape for our brightness. Let's also throw in a little resonance. The resonance will become more apparent once the filter envelope has been designed. We cycle through pages until we see the times and the levels of the filter envelope. Let's see what happens when we slow down the initial time, or time number one. Let's add release to both the filter envelope and the volume envelope. That will be the last rate time number five. You won't actually hear the release portion of the filter envelope until we've also gone to the volume envelope and extended that as well. Let's do that. Let's add the other partials to see how they're sounding with the waveform we've designed. Let's add some LFO to the sound. We can modulate the filter cutoff point. We can modulate the pitch of the oscillator. We could also modulate the width of the pulse wave. We are dealing with a square wave or a pulse wave in this instance. Let's see what happens when we use the LFO to modulate the width of that waveform. This page allows us to manipulate and to modulate the pulse width of the square wave, or the pulse wave, in this instance. The pulse width itself can be changed. And we can also introduce modulation from the LFO number one, two, or three. This is LFO number one. Let's add LFO depth and see what happens to the sound. We've just added pulse width modulation from LFO number one to the square wave in this sound, or the pulse wave in this sound.
hear the internal motion that it adds to the sound. Let's go back and examine the settings for LFO number one and see how we can further alter the kind of pulse width modulation that we hear. We access the LFO parameter and we see familiar variables. We have waveform select, either a triangle wave or a random waveform or a square wave or a sawtooth wave. Let's stay with the random waveform. You can also manipulate the rate. slow or fast. And we can introduce a certain amount of LFO. what our single partial or our oscillator sounds like with a modulated pulse wave, an extended volume envelope, and a little bit of resonance in the filter. Let's reintroduce the original partials, the other three oscillators, into the sound and see what's become of what used to be a harp sound. Let's compare what we've arrived at with the original harp sound. Just trying to get your attention, make sure you haven't snoozed. Let's turn this nice bass sound into a helicopter. We'll do that by adding an enormous amount of filter modulation. First, let's go to the filter and select an LFO as one of its modulating sources. LFO number one. Let's make sure that we increase the LFO amount to maximum. Now, let's go to LFO number one and set its level amount. Son of a gun. That sounds familiar. Let's slow down the frequency a little. Not bad. See how simply an understanding of LFO and its ability to modulate other components enables us to change a sound from one thing to something entirely different by simply changing a few values. Here's a nice organ sound on the Korg M1. Let's play with this organ. I mean, let's modify the organ sound and see what different kinds of organs we can come up with simply by changing some of the parameters we've already discussed. In order to change the sound of this organ patch. Let's first turn it 
from a single oscillator sound to a dual oscillator sound. We change that single to double. Now let's look at the second oscillator, oscillator two. Now it's a piano. But let's select organ one to go along with organ two, which is an oscillator one. All right, so in oscillator one, we have organ two. In oscillator two, we have organ one. You can hear how the new double sound is richer than the original single sound. Here's the sound with both organs. Let's go to oscillator two and see what happens when we change the octave range of organ number one. Again, you can see the many different variations we have of combining these different organ sounds at different octaves. It's like pulling stops out of a regular organ. What happens if we detune oscillator two from oscillator one? We select the detune parameter. See how even a slight amount of detuning can make the already rich sound even richer. Let's now go to the LFO and see whether we can add a lot more frequency modulation or tremolo to the sound directly from the LFO. We cycle through the pages until we reach pitch modulation generator. We select intensity or LFO amount and dial it in and hear what happens to the organ sound. Let's minimize that a little bit, but you can hear the effect. It's turning this into a really modulated organ. Here's the organ without LFO. And here's the organ with a little bit of LFO. Let's speed up the frequency of that LFO and see how it sounds. Let's compare the organ sound we have now with the original single oscillator organ sound. That's the original. That's the original. And here's the one we've edited. It's not that one is better than the other, but one of them is drastically different than the original. And we achieved it simply by manipulating the parameters of sound that we've talked about, those seven main components. First, we selected two different waveforms in a dual oscillator system. Then we changed the frequency of one of those waveforms. And then we introduced frequency modulation from the LFO. Let's see if we can turn this brass envelope into some kind of synth tom-tom by using some noise, manipulating the pitch envelope, and changing the volume envelope. First, let's design a descending pitch envelope. We go into the pitch envelope and slow down the rate at which the pitch envelope moves from step one to step two. Rates go to levels. As you can
can hear one of the oscillators has a pitch envelope which is descending. Let's duplicate that in oscillator number one. some noise. Let's shorten the volume envelopes of oscillators 1 and 2. What we do is find the last rate going to the last level. In this case, we've assigned it as step two. And we shorten the speed that the envelope cycles. a lot more time refining this drum sound, but essentially hear the difference between what we started out with, a brass sound, and what we wound up with simply by adding noise, adding a pitch envelope that descended, and shortening the volume envelopes. We went from here to here. Anyway, folks, that's pretty much it. There are a lot of synths out there, old and new. And I've tried to arrive at some basic concepts that pertain to most, if not all, of these. Understanding the seven main components is crucial to working with any synth. And you're bound to run into three or four of the five most common waveforms, no matter where you go. And remember, if it's a synthesizer, and it was manufactured on the planet Earth, then one way or another, it's going to have to somehow address the three elements of sound pitch, timbre, and volume. Speaking of pitch, drop us a line and get on our mailing list. Then we'll be able to keep you posted about future instructional videos from the New York School of Synthesis. And if you have a particular question that you'd like answered, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope, and we'll try and answer it for you. And if we don't know the answer, hey, we might just keep your stamp. Ha ha ha. Nah, just kidding. We'll give you back your stamp. Anyway, this is Dean Friedman. That's my name, by the way. I'm not the dean of the school or anything. If I was, they'd have to call me uh, Dean Dean, which would be kind of silly. Anyway, thanks for listening. And to all you tintinabulating synthesists out there, happy programming.